Welcome to Bible Insights with Wayne Conrad. God's Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Today's topic, the signs of the times. I want to invite you today to go on an experiment with me. I want you to read the Word of God with me, and I want to try to do it in context so that we can see something that the prophet Jesus is telling us. And let me begin like I'm beginning all over again, okay? Earthquakes, wars in the Middle East and Europe, Russia and China on the move, famine and strange new diseases, signs of the end of the world, or so we are told. Perhaps you've heard preachers and others speak things like this as indicators that the end is just around the corner. As a youth feeling the call to preach, I remember approaching the pulpit from my very first sermon, and I opened the Bible to Matthew 24 and 25 and proceeded to read the entire entirety of Matthew 24 and 25, and then preached a sermon going through the sign list that showed that Jesus was coming very soon. Now, a few decades have passed since then, and I do firmly believe Jesus is coming back to earth in power and glory to gather his people and to establish the new heaven and the new earth. I believe that at the consummation of the ages, Jesus Christ will return bodily to earth on the clouds of heaven with glory, and he shall raise the dead, he shall be the judge, and he shall establish the new order. And the signs, or but the signs, I should say, that we often recite that are written in the Bible, uh, they are there, but I'm afraid we are mistaken about their meaning, about what they are indicating. I I invite you to consider with me the words that Jesus spoke that have been carefully written for us both by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We find it in Mark 13 that I'll be reading from, Luke 21, which I encourage you to read, and Matthew 24 and 25. Since I read all of that on my first sermon, I won't read all of it to you today. But I will begin with Mark chapter 13. Now, as I read this passage, you need to keep in mind what happened before and what will happen after. It's very important. You see, God's word must be read in the context in which it is written. We begin with the words and sentences, the sentences and paragraphs, and the paragraphs under, under a section of meaning, and that section of meaning that are bound together by common themes and connectors are then in certain books, certain sections of the book. This section of Mark begins in Mark chapter 11. This is on the occasion of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on the last week before his death burial, and resurrection from the dead. It's what we call Palm Sunday. It's a day in which Jesus deliberately took to himself the signs of being the Messiah and rode into Jerusalem in fulfillment of the prophecies that are found in Zechariah. And the people began to to shout and proclaim him the Messiah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. Even the children were crying it out, and the religious leaders were very upset. And they told Jesus in no uncertain terms, you should silence your disciples. They should not be speaking like this. And Jesus said to them, if they are silent, the very stones would cry out. Yes, Jesus is proclaiming to be the Messiah, and he's proclaiming openly to be that prophet that Moses spoke about, that king of the kingdom that David spoke about. He is claiming to be the Messiah that Isaiah prophesied about. And so Jesus goes into Jerusalem. And as you read through Mark 11, 12, and 13, It's all about Jesus is going to the temple on this daily basis, him engaging with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the religious leaders in his speaking to them and answering their questions 
and all of his activity is being done in the temple. Now, that's very important because when we open the text to Mark 13, we are immediately confronted with the word temple. It's important that we look what happened right before and what happens afterwards. So I invite you to think about what happened just before the disciples asked Jesus this question. So I'm I'm reading first from Mark chapter 12. It says, and he, that's Jesus, sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. That's how you gave at the temple. If you were giving money, you put it in the offering box. Now, people also presented animals to be sacrificed, etc. But this is what Jesus was doing. He's watching the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums of money. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to them. This is a teaching moment. And he said to them, Truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who were contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all that she had to live on. Now, as he came out of the temple, we're opening to Mark 13, verse 1, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. Now, we know who this is from Luke or Matthew. It's, it's Peter, because he'd observed something that happened on the way into Jerusalem in Mark chapter 11. And so this is part of the context of Jesus' words. And that is that Jesus, on the way into the city, came across a fig tree. And it had leaves on it, and he went to it to eat a fig. But behold, there are lots of leaves and no figs. And Jesus cursed the fig tree, and he said, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard it. Now, something did happen to the tree on that occasion, but the next morning, we're told in one of the writings, that Peter noticed that it had shriveled up by the roots. And he asked Jesus, about it. Keep that in mind. Now, Peter, I believe is the one who says this, but whoever it is, he says, look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. This is a fantastic building. And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So what's Jesus prophesied? Well, he's prophesying the destruction of the temple down to its very foundations. That something will come that will destroy the temple. Now, that's almost unbelievable to these disciples. The, The temple was massive, and it was so built that it was one of the wonders of the ancient world. So the the disciples are startled by Jesus' pronouncements. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, so they proceeded on to the Mount of Olives, and they're looking across it to the great structure of the temple, gleaming with its white stones and its gold. Peter and James and John and Andrew, these are two brothers in two sets. You see, Peter and Andrew are brothers, and James and John are brothers. These four came to him privately. Now, I don't know why they came privately. The other disciples, though, are not there to hear these words. And they tell him, tell us, they ask him, tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? Now, that's their question. Now, I want you to think, what is their question? Did they say, what is the sign of your coming again? No. Did they say, what are the signs of the times? No. They asked him, 
when will these things be? So what are these things? Well, you have to refer back to their question. The question is, when will the temple be destroyed so that one stone is not left on another? When will the temple be destroyed and thrown down? That's what they're asking him. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? Now, they do ask about a sign, but notice it does not use the plural. It uses the singular. It says, what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? Now, I want to urge you now, take your Bible, to read Mark 13, and I want you, as you go through, to underline each time you see it, the word, these things, because that's a key to interpreting this passage of Scripture. And I want you to notice when he changes from the sign of these things to the sign of these things. Now, I began with saying these things because, you see, there are false signs. Jesus begins with a list of what are not the signs. We read it that these are the signs of the end. But Jesus actually is saying in the text that these are not the signs. Let's read what he says. So here's the question again. Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? Now that's one question asking two ways. And Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. Did you hear that? These are signs, yes, but the end is not yet. Yet, so these are not signs of his coming, and these are not the signs about when the temple will be destroyed. So these are false signs, we call them, okay? Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray, because many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pangs. Notice, it's the beginning of the birth pangs, not the end. It's not the delivery. It's the signs that a delivery is coming. Okay? So he says, and be on your guard. So in that one paragraph that I read, we have listed the signs that I began with. These are what we usually call the signs of the times. And we say this is indicators that Jesus is coming back very soon. And many people will then try to match what's happening in the newspaper today or hearing it on the newscast with what these signs are, and they then say, well, Jesus is coming almost any time, any minute. He's coming because, you see, all these things are happening. But if you're honest with yourself, you know if you read in history, these are signs that have been going on for millennium. And yes, there are times when they may be more intense. These are things that do happen, but Jesus is actually saying that these are not the signs of his coming. And these are not even the signs that the temple is about to be destroyed. He goes on. Here's his whole point. Be on your guard. Now why? This is what he says. Be on your guard for they will deliver you over to councils and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, 
but the Holy Spirit. A brother will deliver brother over to death and the father his child. And children will rise against their parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And again, he has not yet told us the sign when the temple will be destroyed. He hasn't told us that yet. But he is telling us what's going to happen with the disciples. He's speaking to this group of men. This is the you that he's talking about. Now, if we look at this passage, verses 9 through 13 in Mark 13, you open the book of Acts and you can read where these things take place. Be on your guard because you'll be delivered over to councils and be beaten in synagogues and stand before governors and kings for my sake bear wet, to bear witness before me. Now that's exactly what happened to the apostles. And you find it, especially zeroing in on Peter and on Paul, James, who was the first martyr. This is what happened right after Jesus' ascension. And the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and the disciples began to boldly proclaim Jesus Christ. First in Jerusalem and then in Judea and then to Samaria and then to the Gentiles, ultimately to Rome, to all of the Roman world, to the known world of these disciples, the gospel went forth in their lifetime. As a result, they were brought before trial, they were arrested, they were beaten Many of them were killed. And Jesus said, be on your guard for persecution is going to come. And don't be anxious about how you will defend yourself. When the time comes and they haul you before governors, etc., just relax. Call upon my name because the Holy Spirit will give you in that moment what you are to say. This is not a cover for preachers to go and preach just whatever they feel like it. This isn't talking about preaching at all. He's talking about witness for Christ in Christ's situation where you might be faced with persecution. Now he gets to the sign. Listen. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out of it. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. Alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For a false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. Now, that's the sign. What is the sign? Well, it's the appearance of the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be. I wonder where that is. Well, that's in the temple. It's in the temple. In Jerusalem. Well, what's he talking about? He said, let not those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let not those whose housetop not go down. No, it says, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, I'm sorry, and do not let them go down from the housetop to try to get anything. When you see this sign, get out of town. That's what he said. All of you who believe in me, you disciples and all those that you've gathered to you in Jerusalem, leave the town and go to the mountains. And do you know that's exactly what the Christians did? Because what Jesus is doing here is he is prophesying about the destruction of the temple that happened in 70 AD when the Roman legions destroyed the temple, tore down 
all of it. It took them a long time. In fact, the city was under siege for more than two years. But before it went under siege, the Christians who saw the advancing banners of the Roman army fled the city. Now, when he says, let the reader understand, you have to understand that when the scriptures were first given to the Christians, they didn't have Bibles in their pews and in their house. They had a scroll that was written. Here's a mark, the scroll written by Mark, and it's circulated among some of the churches. And they have one scroll, and the reader must read the word to the people as I'm doing to you right now. Let the reader understand. Why? Well, he needs to understand for two things. Number one, he should understand because it has reference to the Old Testament. It has reference to what we call the Old Testament, primarily to the book of Daniel, where we're introduced to the abomination of desolation. And there we discover that the abomination of desolation came to pass in history during the period when the Greeks were in control of Israel. And Antiochus Epiphanes came and slaughtered a pig in the Jerusalem precincts defiling the temple and set up the things to proclaim his gods there. And the Romans come in 70 AD and they do something similar. They set up their gods there in Jerusalem where the temple was. This is what happened. Jesus is prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem and the judgment that came upon his people because they had rejected him as the Messiah. That's the meaning of the cursing of the fig tree. This is what happened. It happened in history. And it proves that Christ is a true prophet of God. Because what he prophesied came to pass. And you can find it verified in history. You can open up the book of the antiquities of the Jews. And there you'll find it being recorded by Josephus, who is being hired and paid for by the Romans to chronicle the history of the Jews. Now that is the first section of Mark 13. These are the signs that are not the sign of the coming of the destruction of the temple nor is it the sign of the coming of the Son of Man in power and glory. It is a sign of the coming of God in power and judgment upon Jerusalem and upon the people who have rejected him. But he goes on to make other remarks. But in those days after that tribulation. So there's a change He's speaking now beyond that event. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he shall send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree... Learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Now, let me stop there just a moment. Because, you see, he begins to give what we call apocalyptic signs. Now, those signs are sometimes used in the uh, prophets to speak about God's acts of judgment. So that may be what they're speaking about there. It also will signal the same kind of things will happen when the Lord actually does return in person, in power, in glory. In these particular verses, it may be referring to to that destruction in Jerusalem primarily, but it certainly has reference to his coming at the end of the ages. Now, I want you to keep this in mind because we're going to come to this very difficult verse. It says, learn a lesson from the, from the fig tree. 
As soon as his branches become tender and puts out at least, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, what are these things? That refers back to the destruction of the temple. I told you to mark those as you went through this passage. So these things is talking about the destruction of the temple that happened in 70 AD. So he says, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, he's not saying that these disciples are going to live all the way up until Jesus Christ comes back physically to the earth in his resurrected body that he ascended to heaven in. He's talking about the fact that the words of prophecy that he's given concerning the destruction of the temple will come to pass in the generation of those disciples to whom he is speaking. Heaven and earth may pass away, but his words will not pass away, and they remain true. But now Jesus then answers the question, when is the coming of Christ? When is the end of the world? How do we know it? Here's Jesus' answer. Concerning that day or that hour, no one knows not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. That's Jesus' statements. That's Jesus' explanation of the signs of the times, which he corrects to say, the signs of the times is not the sign of the coming of the Son of Man, nor was it the sign of the destruction of the temple but the coming of the abomination of desolation towards Jerusalem that caused the Christians to flee to Pella, and thus they were saved from destruction, is the sign of God's judgment upon the nation for their rejection of him. Now, this is why Christ cried as he came into Jerusalem on that last week, as he approached the city, and he cried with weeping and said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. I would have gathered you as a hen does her chicks, but you would not. This has been Wayne Conrad with Bible Insights. Until next time, be awake, be alert. Christ will come again.